the second week of Lent. And then uh, just a few considerations here. Good to be here again in uh, Pocatello. And just a few considerations. We read today in the uh, in the Mass about the Esau and Jacob. And that the day in which Jacob went to get his blessing in the name of Esau. And he went to get his blessing. And it's interesting here about timing. The day of his considerations about timing. We have now this, uh, a few days ago in America, we're all at peace and happy. And then uh, now there's a great panic about the coronavirus. A virus affecting 0.00001% of the population, maybe. The report yesterday was that there was uh, 1,920 cases in the United States of the coronavirus and 41 deaths. You know that, however, we meant to look at the exact number, but I forgot the number, I didn't get a chance to look at the exact number, but several thousand people died last year. 4,000 died just earlier this year from the virus, from the normal flu virus. And many, several thousand more died last year from being electrocuted. So clearly there's an electricity virus going around. And then if you are connected with electricity, there is a great, grave danger of being electrocuted. If you lick your fingers and you stick it into an outlet, it's very possible this may cause electrocution. If a power line falls across the road and you try to pick it up like an idiot, you will be fried. If you get struck by lightning, you will die. But now there's an electricity crisis in the world because, after all, electricity is very dangerous. Extremely dangerous. And many people die because of electricity. Therefore, we should quarantine people so that they will not be exposed to the dangers of electricity. Now, it is exactly the same kind of reasoning that is found by the modern world in which they say that, you know, the reason people die by, the, by means of guns. They die because of guns. Therefore, guns should be taken away from all the people so they cannot die from guns. But did you know that many more people die every year because of knives. Knives are used to stab people and to kill them. Therefore, there is a knife virus going around the world, and there is a very grave danger of people dying from knives. Now, here is a problem about knives. Supposing, in order to make people safe, we take knives away from them. How are you going to eat a cow the next time you want to eat a cow? You're going to go out in the field and try to bite on one? It will be bad for your health. How are you going to eat fish? How are you going to eat broccoli? How are you going to eat potatoes? How are you going to eat any food without a knife? But there's a knife epidemic. There's an electricity epidemic. There is a flu outbreak. Now we have an outbreak of the coronavirus. If you look on the back of the Lysol can, you can all look at your Lysol cans. These people may have lice, many people have Lysol in their houses. It lists one of the things that the Lysol kills is the coronavirus. It's mentioned there that it's killed the, it kills the coronavirus. And yet we have a totally new virus that has never come in history. Many people believe this virus is totally new. And so that the, the Lysol company has the gift of prophecy. They were able to put the coronavirus on the labels of their cans that this kills the coronavirus before the actual virus came to kill us. What is going on? This is a test. This is a test of the Masons, a test of the Bilderbergers, a test of the deep state, a test of preparation for the coming of the Antichrist, a test for how ready the people are ready for a one world government. This is only a test of the emergency broadcast system. But this is also a test. It is a test of souls. We are all running around peacefully, and now there's a toilet paper crisis. You should have bought stocks and toilet paper last week. You'd be a millionaire this week. Because everybody is going to buy toilet paper, and the purchase of toilet paper very much is quite fitting for the world today. If you look at toilet paper, it's not very reusable. There's no market for pre-owned toilet paper out there. Also, toilet paper is only useful for the exiting of food. 
Now, if you don't have any food and you're dying of starvation, you won't need toilet paper. If it doesn't come in, don't worry, it won't go out. And so they're worried about toilet paper. We are in a sick and upside down world. And this is a test. Everywhere in all the, paper, all the stores throughout the United States and Canada, toilet paper is gone. Everyone must have a clean exit. When someone's 80 years old, they worry about their mascara. They worry about their health. They want to look good when they're lying in their graves. But are we meant to prepare for death? Are we meant to prepare for an exit? Or are we meant to prepare for life? The fact is, God did not make us to die. He did not make us for an exit, clean exit. He made us to enter the kingdom of heaven. And he gives us tests during this life to see, are we ready to enter heaven? Because our Lord Jesus Christ himself said, You know not the day or the hour of my visit. If you knew the day or the hour, if only you knew, you'd have bought stock and toilet paper. You bought stock in Charmin last week. But those people who maybe did know bought all kinds of... Now Walmart is going out. Walmart struggling. All these uh, Costco is struggling. But now they're selling everything they got. They're making good money. If only they knew last week. Now what about this virus? Don't worry, it's fine. Don't worry. Now what about this virus? We have a coronavirus. It was an epidemic, they claimed. Now it's a pandemic. It's spreading throughout the whole world. The great crisis of corona. Now what is interesting, what are they testing? They, the usual they, the unknown they. What are they testing? They're testing the hearts, the minds, the corruption, the willingness to obey, and the, uh, and the foolishness of the man of today. This is a test. <laughs> What is God testing? The angels are also testing who is ready for a crisis. And how do you prepare for a crisis? <laughs> Yesterday, one of, my faithful, one of my faithful in one of our parish, parishes in the middle of nowhere, and they were in a store yesterday, and in the store they're out shopping, and a lady said, you know what, I'm buying bullets. A lady of some size lady with a few little kids says, you know, I'm buying bullets because, because I'm not going to starve. And if I and my kids are starving, I'm going to a rich man's house and I'm taking his food. That's in the middle of nowhere. In 1976 or 77, I forget the exact year, mid-70s, there was a blackout in New York City that went through the entire night. About 15 years before, in the 1950s, there was a blackout in New York City that went through the entire night. The same city. Now, in the 1950s, when there was a blackout, there was no power for an entire night from 6 in the evening until about in the morning. And the blackout that happened in New York City was in the... One of them was wintertime, the other one was summertime. But when a blackout happened... And in the 1950s, the people laughed, they sat in the streets, they lit candles, they ate food, they talked to one another. There were no deaths. Fifteen years later, 18 years later, in the 1970s, one was before Vatican II blackout, the other one was an after Vatican II blackout. A blackout happened in New York City. And there was robbing and looting of stores. There were murders. There was chaos in the streets. There was beating up the police because the lights went out for a few hours. What was the difference between 1957, whatever year it was, and 1973-74? It's around those times, not the exact years. You need to look it up. What was the difference between those two blackouts? The state of the souls of New Yorkers. That was the difference. Before Vatican II, there was a little bit of crime, but not much. There was a little bit of difficulty, but not much, and everyone handled the crisis fine. After Vatican II, there was chaos. And now it was interesting also, people committed their very first crimes in that blackout. And the ones who were arrested, there were several thousand New Yorkers arrested that night for robbing and looting stores. None of them were criminals, because the criminals know how to rob and get away. They know how to escape the police. 
The ones who were robbed, were, were arrested, were arrested for their very first time for having robbed a store, stealing things of no value to, for a crisis, stealing TV sets, stealing radios, uh, stealing whatever is available because anarchy ensued. Now, this is a test. It is a supernatural test, and it is a test of the bad guys. The bad guys are testing how foolish are the sheep of the world. Are they ready to listen to anything and everything? Right now, for instance, all daycares are closing down, schools are closing down, and public meetings are being shut down. Now, the government has shut down a few of these things, but our test is, are the people willing to be good citizens and make sure they don't get the virus? Now, what is it that is the motivating cause? St. Thomas Aquinas teaches us, following Aristotle, the Holy Roman Catholic Church teaches that every agent acts for an end. Omni agens agit propter finem. We teach the seminarians in Latin. Every agent acts for an end. Every person acts for a purpose. Now we are human beings. We are called rational animals or political animals. We are animals of reason. And therefore when we act for a purpose, we have to know what that purpose is and we've got to go after that purpose. Now our purpose is happiness. What is our happiness found in? If that thing that we find happiness in is threatened, we get very angry and we get very violent. And so this is a test. One day, a deacon named Lawrence was put to the test. And Lawrence, the great deacon, back in the 200s and in Rome, he was told to go and gather the treasures of the church. And he went out and gathered all the poor of the city of Rome after he'd already been tortured one time. And he brought them before the emperor and he said, these are the treasures of the church. The emperor was not impressed. He wanted the money. He knew that Lawrence was in charge of the money. And he didn't. And Lawrence didn't bring him money. He said, what happened to the money? I gave all the money to the poor. There it is. It's in them. And these are our treasures. And therefore, the emperor was angry. He was roasted on a gridiron. And Lawrence was telling jokes. Lawrence was happy. Why? Because his treasure was safe. What was his treasure? It was to know, love, and serve God in his heart. It was to live in the grace of God and go to the kingdom of heaven. And they couldn't take the treasure of divine grace out of his soul. And he couldn't take the treasure of divine truth out of his soul. And therefore he was happy while they took away his health. And they burned him upon the gridiron. And as they were burning him and taking away his health, he said, they began to turn him to burn on the other side. And he said, not yet. The meat is not cooked. <laughs> and then his final words before he died were, turn and eat. It's cooked. That was the thought of Lawrence. Times have changed since 250 A.D. Now we find ourselves near 2020 A.D. 1,800 years later. And the World Health Organization, called WHO, the World Health Organization has said, your health may be in danger. Now a few years ago, Terrorists were supposed to have blown up the World Trade Center and killed a few thousand people that were innocent. We don't really care. A short time ago, someone was supposed to have killed several hundreds of people in Las Vegas. But if you live two blocks away from the shootings, it didn't affect you, so who cares? People don't care about the murders of thousands. They don't care about the murders of hundreds of thousands or of millions. So what happens? The World Health Organization says, you might receive a little virus that was made by man and transported from Winnipeg, from Canada to China and then brought back part of our economic system. Now the fact is, your health may be affected. And what is this test of? Who matters to you? I matter to me. And my health may be affected, and therefore I will kill the rich man. I will attack anyone who gets in my way. 
I'm going to get all the toilet paper. Reports of Americans who are middle class Americans fighting over the Charmin, fighting over the toilet paper. This is my toilet paper. This is my toilet paper. This is my toilet paper because they want to be prepared for the epidemic. Good American businessmen and Canadian businessmen have been selling lotion, hand lotion, $286 a bottle. They said there was a good New York businessman back in 1905 or whatever year it was, and there was a major storm causing the railroad to shut down in New York City. And there was a place where the subway is above ground, and this train was stuck above ground. But there was a New York businessman. He had a ladder. He was going on the train with his ladder. So he let the ladder down, and he says, you want to go down the ladder, you got to pay me ten bucks. Now, there were some people that couldn't pay. He took the ladder down, and they froze to death and died in the storm. Whoever couldn't pay died. And that's capitalism. Now the fact is, we are now in a time where there's a little test of a crisis. Is capitalism going to get you to the crisis? Is communism going to get you to the crisis? Is modernism going to get you to the crisis? Is taking care of your health going to get you through the crisis? Remember, our Lord Jesus Christ talked about it. Turns out men are not that different than what they were before. He said there was a wise man that was well prepared for the coronavirus. He was well prepared for an attack on the outside. He was well prepared for hard times. He stored all the food that he had. He got all the food off of Alex Jones's uh, Info Wars to get you through hard times. He got all the food available in the stores. He got grains, the cans of granola, and he put it inside his walls, and his barn was full. And what does our Lord Jesus Christ tell us in the gospel? He died in the night with a full barn. How many souls are so well prepared for a crisis? Their health is going to be preserved during a crisis. What health is going to be preserved? What is the health that matters? It is the health of my soul that matters. It is not the health of my body. And if I work for my health and my health and my health, what worries us? And what about our supernatural health? You know, there are many souls that say, I need my Mass every Sunday. Well, you know that Pope Francis said, it's not healthy to go to Mass on Sunday. It's not healthy anymore. This Sunday, it's not healthy because of the coronavirus. And therefore, it's unhealthy for priests to say Mass on Sunday. That's a good thing because it's the new Mass. The less times they say it, the better. They should do that every Sunday. But the fact is, that that's not his purpose. He likes the demonic things going on every Sunday. But nonetheless, we're not going to have church on Sunday because it's bad for your health. Therefore, the people will stay home. Some bishops have said there's going to be no Mass until after Easter. Others have said it is unhealthy to give communion on the tongue. We are now forbidding communion on the tongue because we know that there are traditional people that like the communion on the tongue. That's unhealthy. It's so much more healthy to put the communion in the hand because then you get a sacrilege combined with picking up germs. The other way, you only get to pick up germs. This way, you get a sacrilege plus the germs instead of just the sacrilege or just the germs. The hands touch garbage and touch bad things all the time. Do they care about your health? No. These are not the friends of God and they are not the friends of the poor, and they are not the friends of our health. And is there a real epidemic going on? Is there a real pandemic going on? They lie to us every day. It's a test. Who is ready? Who? What matters to souls? In 1957, electricity goes out. There are no murders. There is no crime. Very minimal. In 1977, the same things happened, and it's horrible. But not that bad. What about a blackout in 2020? 77 is going to seem like a picnic. Remember in 1991 when there was riots 
in L.A., the Rodney King riots. Police officers in uniform went into the Walmarts and stole televisions. Not only did the people go and steal, the police went and stole in their uniforms on duty. That didn't happen in 77. It was the non-police that did it. In 91, police also participated in the crime. What about today? We're in a time where the world is getting closer and closer to anarchy. Complete chaos. Now, what happened in the, in the 1800s, in the protocols of the elders of Zion, and also in the, in the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Alta Vendita, a hundred years before that, we will create a crisis, a global crisis created by ourselves. And when this crisis comes, there will be complete chaos. And we will tell the people, do you want the crisis to go away? Do you want your cell phones back? you want us to make you new toilet paper? <laughs> you want to get back to a normal life? No problem. You just have to give away your freedoms. You just have to give away your rights. You just have to obey us in everything and give up the sovereignty of your governments and trust the goodness of the one world government. And everything will be fine. Now what is going to happen to many souls? What about the souls that say, I need my Mass every Sunday? When the time comes, your mass is taken from you. Well, then what? Will you persevere in the faith? Can you live your faith without the mass every Sunday? God gives us the ability to live with the faith whether we have mass every Sunday or not. And timing matters. And it's very interesting. It's in the epistle today. I didn't read the epistle today because it's so long. It's a beautiful epistle from the book of Genesis. A real, true historical event in which one day Esau was told by his father Jacob, Go hunting today. You go out and you go hunting. And you catch of some kind of great venison or some meat. And you bring it back to me. And you cook it the way I want. And after I have eaten, I will give you a blessing. And Esau said, I am ready. Now on the exact same day, only a few minutes later, the Rebecca said to Jacob, or rather, yeah, Rebecca said to Jacob, he said, Jacob, I want you to kill some kids that are in the barn that are already there because we raise those kinds of things. And I want you to kill them. I want you to bring them to me, your mother. Not Jacob, but Isaac speaking to Jacob and Esau. And I, Rebecca said to Jacob, you go and get that food and you bring it back. And then I will cook it and you will bring it to your father. But you must go now because Esau at this very moment has gone hunting. You don't have time. You must act now. And Jacob said yes. He said he was afraid, but then he said yes. He brought the kids to his mother. She cooked them. She put skins upon his hands so that he would look like his, feel like his brother Esau. Because remember, Isaac was blind. And he, would, he, he did not under, could not see Jacob or Esau. And then he brought food. And Jacob, or rather, uh, Isaac blessed Jacob. And Esau came. We have an expression about it. He came a day late. He came a dollar short. He missed the boat. And it wasn't until I went to the Philippines and realized how painful it is to miss a boat. Because if you miss a plane here, and you miss, when you go to the airport, there's a gate, and there's a big gap between you and that plane, and there's the door of the plane, and the plane takes off. But when you miss the boat, you're standing one foot away from that stinking boat. It's moving at .0001 mile per hour. And you're looking at the boat, and you're standing on the pier, and there is the boat. But the door is closed, and they won't let you on the boat. 
and you watch it pull away at one mile an hour and you miss the boat. It's a very painful experience, especially when the next boat is tomorrow or next week. You were only one minute late and you missed the boat. Timing matters. In the old days, in the Philippines, you only had to wait one day for a boat. In Spain, you had to wait one year for the next boat. You missed that boat by one minute, and you've got to wait another year? What about the boat that's going to heaven? Or well, the Holy Roman Catholic Church? The boat of sanctifying grace. The boat of judgment. When they close the door and say, it's too late. When you miss that boat, it's over forever. And this is a test. What matters to us? Is it our souls? Is it our faith? Or is it our bodies? Is it our physical health? Like Father Cyprian, the old monk, said very wisely to a young hippie down in New Mexico a few years ago. You're going to take beer and put that in your body, man? That's not healthy. Yeah, I'm going to take beer and bring it to the monks. He says, you know, son, one of these days you and I are going to die. And you're going to die healthy. Is his health going to stop him from dying? One of my parishioners a few years ago went to the doctor, got a clean bill of health. Went home and died. My own grandfather was guaranteed by the doctors when I was about one year old. Or maybe even before I was born. My own grandfather was guaranteed by the doctors, you're dead in a few hours. And 12 men, like the apostles, stood around his deathbed to say goodbye to him. One of them was 16 years old. Every one of those 12 died before my grandfather. Including the 16-year-old. Every single man that stood around that bed to say goodbye, Grandpa. They all died before he did. Doctors aren't that smart. God decides the moment of, moment of life, moment of death. He should have said goodbye to you all because I want to be at every one of your funerals. And he was at every one of their funerals. This is not the time of the great fight. I don't believe so. But it is a test. We must keep our faith even if they shut down the roads, keep our faith that they shut down the airports, keep our faith that they shut down the food, keep our faith that they cut us off from everyone else. We must live by the life and love of God, no matter what happens. Now, can you prepare today? Esau could not prepare on that day, and neither could Jacob. Either Jacob already loved his mother, or he didn't. Either Jacob was ready to listen to his mother, or he wasn't. Either Jacob was there like a homeboy, or he wasn't. He was home every day. And so when the day came, he was there. And when the day came, the two kids were there. He didn't know the day. Esau didn't know the day either. And God said to, to, to Isaac said to Esau, go hunting. But the problem was it, he wasn't fast enough. He wasn't fast enough. He was a bit like the old great coach of Kentucky, Adolf Rupp, used to say. He says, you know what second place is? He's the first guy to lose. That's all it is. He's just the first guy to lose. Do you want to be the first guy to lose? The second guy to lose? The third guy to lose? No, we were made to be winners. And the winner is not chosen on the day of the race. The winner must be ready before the race, before the whistle blows, before the gun shoots off. What is in our hearts today? That's what matters. And God knows what's in our hearts. So it's a little test. What are we worrying about right now? Are we worrying about the food? Are we worrying about making sure we've got enough guns to defend ourselves from our neighbors? What's going to happen in the next two weeks? Coronavirus may kill a few people. But look what's happening next two weeks. School is out. What kind of people go to school? We used to call them boys and girls. But now we call them little Satans. <laughs> little Satans are going to school. 
They have to go through metal detectors to be in school. They got to be watched at all times when they're inside of the school. They have no moral code of any kind. Now they got two weeks without being watched by a teacher. Hmm. Two weeks without being monitored by anyone. The mommy and daddy had never been part of their lives before these two weeks. They dropped them off at daycare. They sent them off to school. And now mommy has to stay home or daddy has to stay home, which everyone's making less money, so that's daddy. Daddy's got to stay home and watch the kids. People aren't showing up at work. Kids have nothing to do for two weeks. Guess what's going to happen in the next two weeks? Every sin you can imagine. There will be an increase of every vice. There will be more need for prisons. There will be men that for the voice for the first time who experiment robbing 7-Elevens. First time experimenting robbing. First time experimenting every kind of crime. There will be deaths. There will be deaths. Because no kids are in school. Because people are locked in their own houses and quarantined. Because the police won't be able to handle the calls. And there'll be so many false calls combined with so many true calls that which one's which? We need not fear the virus that attacks the body. It is the virus that attacks the soul. And this virus has been in our church now for 700 years. And especially the last 500 years since Protestantism. And in the most wicked and most pandemic and epidemic way since Vatican II. New York City had deaths and tragedies in 1970s in New York City because electricity went out. Why? Because of Vatican II. They didn't have that happen in the 1950s. Why? Because there was still a stable, even though corrupting, Catholic Church. If we have faith in our minds, if we have the love of God in our hearts, we need not fear pandemics and epidemics and crises. But if we do not have faith in our hearts, great tragedy is going to ensue. But in any case, it's only a test. And remember, Esau did not know. Today he was going hunting with such expectations to get a blessing. And he did not get it. And Jacob was getting up just another day. And yet, on that day, he received great blessings. Now what happened after Jacob got his blessings? Jacob received blessings from God. Through Isaac. And what happened? The next morning came... And Rebecca said, Jacob, run. You got blessings now. Esau wants to kill you because of your blessings. Esau is very angry and he wants vengeance. Run. And Jacob ran. And he ran. He went to sleep at a place which is now called Bethlehem. And he was exhausted. And he laid down in the night, and he put his head upon a rock, which is called Bethel. And when he put his head upon that rock, shaped like a piece of bread, hence Bethlehem means a piece of bread, place of bread, house of bread. He was tired. He had to run away from home. He had just received a blessing the day before. He was scared. He didn't have his mother with him, whom he depended upon for everything. And in exhaustion, he fell asleep, and he saw a ladder going from the earth to heaven. He saw angels going up and down that ladder. And the angels were bringing blessings from earth down to he down from heaven, down to earth. And they were bringing the prayers and heart of Jacob. And they were bringing his, his spirit up to heaven. And then they were bringing blessings down to earth. Because what did Isaac tell him the day before? He said, whoever blesses you shall be blessed. Whoever curses you shall be cursed. There's going to be a blessing and it depends on Jacob. Jacob is also called Israel, which is the one that fights with God. Anyone else fights with God, they lose. But when Jacob fights with God, he wins. So who do you want to be with if you fight with God? Be with Jacob. And Jacob is our holy mother of the church. Jacob is our Catholic faith. 
And who blesses Jacob is blessed. And who curses Jacob is cursed. And Jacob would have 12 sons. And we read about them in the sacred scripture yesterday. He had 12 sons. One of them was Joseph. The others were not very good. But God blessed them anyway. And he made his church holy. Now what is it that matters? We must have the spirit of Jacob inside of us. And not Esau. We must have a love of our mother. We must have a desire to please our mother, who is the Blessed Virgin Mary, and our Holy Mother, the Church, in her holy faith, and live by that faith, and live by sanctifying grace, and they may take the Mass away from us for 200 years, like they did to the Japanese. They may take it away for weeks or months, but they'll never take Christ from our hearts. They'll never take Him from our minds, and we will pass the test. Not only have the faithful been without Mass, but many times priests themselves have been without the Mass. They've been locked in prisons like St. Peter and unable to celebrate the Mass for a long period of time. Or like St. Paul, locked in prison and not able to celebrate the Mass. A priest not able to receive Holy Communion. A priest not able to celebrate the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. But what did he do in that prison? St. Peter saw a man who needed Christ. And he said, you need Christ. And he said, well, I want to be baptized. But there was no water where this should be baptized. So Peter put his fists into the stone. And, there, and the stone went down and created a little bowl. And water came into that bowl. And he took that water and he baptized him. He got what he needed in prison. Whatever is needed, God will provide. And what is the most necessary thing that is needed? Know, love, and serve God. And then whatever crises they bring to us, they will not bring us down. They will not disturb us. We will live, if necessary, without the Mass for a time. If necessary, without, the, without all the things we are used to having for a time. But God will take care of us. And remember, this is a test of the bad guys on one side. It is a test of the angels on the other. And let's make sure that we pass the test of the angels. And seek first the kingdom of God and His justice. And all else will be added to us besides. Pray bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.